Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, day four of our Soil and Water Management Week uh, Dealing with Dry Conditions webinar series. Uh, today, um, we are moving into soil fertility and nutrient management decisions following drought conditions. And so um, we have, of course, John Hurd here. And on our panel again today, we also have Curtis Cavers and Kim Brown Livingston and myself to be able to answer questions as they're coming in. Uh, first number, first reminder for everybody, as you already know from the last couple of days, uh, but if anybody is new joining us today, there is a questions tab. And in the questions tab, please type in any questions that you have for our panelists regarding the um, what we're talking about this week. And uh, we will answer those for you. Um, the other thing we wanted to chat about is tomorrow. And so we had said at the very beginning that we were going to have this free for all Friday, this option to uh, be on on Friday and basically answer extra questions, things like that have come in. We've been getting excellent questions coming in from uh, you guys so far this week. And we've been able to, I think, answer most of those questions as we've been going through. So we're actually gonna put it to you to make the decision on whether you wanna come back tomorrow. Um, and in order to come back tomorrow, if you want, um, we would like to hear from you what uh, ideas or questions you have, things that we haven't covered yet this week that you are really pressing or, or burning to, uh, to kind of discuss and hear more about. Uh, with relation to these dry conditions that we're dealing with. So what we're going to do is if you have any additional questions that are soil and drought related, um, that please email them to me. And I would like you to email them to me um, by noon today if you can. And we are going to make the call at noon if there's enough questions that have come in that we are going to continue with Friday. And if not, you'll all get a notification um, email through the GoToWebinar system if we've canceled tomorrow's webinar. But we are here for you tomorrow if you guys have additional topics that you want to make sure are covered. So we just wanted to put that out. So a reminder, that is my email on the screen right now. Uh, please email me sometime before noon so that we can make the call for tomorrow. All right, so um, moving on then. So John Hurd, you can take it away and get us talking about post drought considerations for nutrient management, and then we will get right into our questions after. Okay, thanks Marla and thanks for the, the opportunity to do this because it seems there's been no shortage of questions pop up this year. So I'll run through some of this with some background, but uh, I'll leave a bunch of the discussion for the call in session also. So, uh, oh, the first thing is a quiz uh, that uh, I'll get to at the end, but uh, you need to add some words to your vocabulary if you're going to be a drought agronomist. And uh, the four are the first is the birch effect the next one is hang off uh nitrate toxicity many of you will be aware of if you're working with livestock growers and one you'll have never heard of before and that is the solar corridor so we'll get to answering those uh, uh terminologies uh towards the end of my session here so uh first of all a few of the things to go over uh we'll talk about uh uh, high residual nitrogen tends to be one of the, the main observations we've been seeing. And in there, I'll, I'll, I'll cover a bit on the, you know, the unused nitrogen. We'll talk about the birch effect. Uh, something that uh, uh, is, is a question right now, are some of these levels we're measuring, are they static or are they likely to change? And so we'll go over some of those factors that may yet change that number that you're seeing. Uh, we're going to cover some, uh, not only uh, some background, but we'll do a case study or two on some volunteer uh, or regrowth and cover crops and their nutrient uptake. Uh, answer some of the questions about straw and its implications in removal this year and mineralization. A bit on whether we're going to have residual phosphate and potash to rely on, and then a uh, uh, just a, a little teaser at the end about fall fertilizer application, because it still feels like August out there, not October. So the first thing, uh, just looking at a, a very elementary graph here and why it is that we really are not surprised with high nitrate carryover numbers, because uh, uh, just some of the lower yields that were achieved uh, that were limited by rainfall. And it's great to be able to go back 
and use some of the uh, classic uh, research done in Manitoba where they actually separated yield response of wheat and barley, uh, but we're here we're looking at wheat into those environments that were moist. So that, th those would be periods where there was one or two dry period during the year, uh, dry uh, where it was uh, drier than that. Sometimes that's Western Manitoba or some sandier soils and then arid. Those were those tests where water was really yield limiting. And uh, there's a few things from this graph I just want to show, but th these were the, the curves that we use, uh, the currently use in uh, our calculator. Uh, you need a curve in order to do uh, 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 economic-based uh, calculations. So that's, these, that's why we use them. Just a, a few things from the graph here. We can see under the, the, the moist, that yield potential goes up and, ooh, that is supposed to be marking for me. Come on, that pin. Okay, there we are. Uh, where uh, many probably fertilized for the higher yield potential in the spring because prices were good and we didn't want to leave yield on the table. So we probably had a bunch of fertility applied in that range, but in the heart of the Red River Valley here, we had a lot of yields top out here with the arid uh, wheat yields in the 30 bushel range. And under that curve, we can see that we're pretty well a full 100 pounds of nitrogen that was potentially uh, left over or unused. S something else from this graph that's, that's interesting is uh, how moist soils make up for nitrogen. That you can see that under a moist environment, we could produce those 30 bushels with 10 to 20 pounds of nitrogen. That's because we're getting some mineralization under those moist conditions. Under dry conditions, nitrogen is less efficient. Uh, there's less mineralization and there's less water for, for mass flow uptake. So that's why here, uh, uh, yes, it's not 20 pounds we need to produce a 30 bushel crop, but about 60. So anyways, we use some of these classic uh, relationships in our decision-making when we get to dry and, and, and arid weather conditions. Yeah, you knew it was going to come. There's the nitrogen cycle on this. I want to use this to kind of point out what was different than normal this year and may have led to, to things, uh, uh, high levels. First of all, starting here, the, the good nitrogen rates, they were applied this spring uh, because yield potentials, we were still hopeful and crop prices were very promising. So nitrogen was certainly applied and then it went through the cycle. Uh, uh, it would transform into nitrate. And then where did it go after it transformed to nitrate? Well, it was not wet enough for much leaching. So we didn't experience those type of losses. It was not, soils were not saturated enough for denitrification. So that was really not a pathway of loss this year. And plant uptake was much reduced if we were in one of some of those drought areas. So uh, we can see that that may be why we have more remaining or sticking around as nitrate. Uh, one of the dark horses is what went on with mineralization this past year. Uh, and, and, and we'll go into some of that, not just that, but how might immobilization be taking place now? With lower yields, we've got lower straw return and that has implications on um, Less nitrogen being tied up this fall to, to decompose straw. Uh, many agronomists and, and farmers, you have already seen this. Uh, Agvise Labs uh, is uh, uh, generous enough with uh, the data that they collect to uh, group it and show some of the trends that they're seeing. And uh, this is their, their most recent uh, uh, notice that they put out. And the interesting thing here is I've highlighted, these are the percent of fields coming back with over 100 pounds of nitrate in. And we can see the highest being in parts of South Central Manitoba, certainly the interlake, parts of the Southeastern. Uh, 
Sometimes the southeastern is more also because we, we have a lot of uh, hog barns in that area. And so sometimes we have some higher uh, residual levels there. But this year certainly increased because of the dry conditions. More typical uh, rates, what we would expect to see year in, year out, somewhere between 30 to 40 pounds residual in. And if you look for a part of the province more typical of, of more normal would be parts of Western Manitoba where maybe there's several areas out there that did receive uh, some good and timely rains, getting some good yields, some good removals. And so I'm not surprised to see some of their soil test levels coming in uh, closer to normal. But uh, you know, uh, look at a, something like this, the South Inner Lake, less than 10% of the samples coming in at low or very low. So a real distortion from what uh, uh, a normal year would have been. Uh, the Ag Vice was also provided this. This is the nitrogen after canola. Some of these levels, these are the averages, tend to be a bit more than those following wheat. Uh, and again, this kind of being the average, we could see that these values range 40, 80 pounds more uh, nit residual nitrogen than the long-term average, but not everybody. Uh, so this really re requires people to make decisions on their own uh, tests and analysis of their fields. Does it talk about mineralization? Um, because um, it, it, it does drive a lot of the, the nitrogen availability or tie up in the soil. And uh, uh, we, we suspected that it was so dry this year that uh, during the, the dry area, dry period of year, it actually depressed microbial activity. And enough so that we're wondering if we uh, triggered this Birch effect, uh, that uh, this is something that is well established uh, in other parts of the world where they have regular routine dry seasons followed by wet seasons. Here, uh, that's not so frequent but it, it, it's something that we, we certainly may have experienced that later in August, once soils started to re-wet with some of those first rains, we may have seen this. What happens is that uh, under the very dry condi conditions we might have, uh, a lot of those uh, bacteria or mi microbes uh, desiccate or, or are killed, so, but some survive. Upon initial wetting, they feast upon those dead bodies of their uh, former colleagues, and there's a flush or release of, of nitrate nitrogen that can be detected both by the soil test and, and plants if they happen to be growing. And uh, so this, this burst uh, in, in studies in, in Africa, they say it could range from 20 to 110 pounds of nitrate of nitrogen per acre for a short period of time until either microbial growth and immobilization kicks in again, or plants take up that nitrogen. Um, I'm thinking that uh, this is probably minor compared to the, uh, the big rates of nitrate in that are left just because of, of poor crop growth and removal. But uh, I have spoken to a few agronomists that took samples in the, in, in the dry period had one nitrate in level and then sampled after rewetting, and they were seeing some of this 30 pound increase in nitrate in. That that may be uh, an artifact of this uh, birch effect. Uh, something else in regards to straw removal, uh, how it may be affecting things. Uh, with less straw being produced, uh, with a lot of short crops, uh, cereals certainly. Uh, there's less of that straw remaining to immobilize or sop up leftover nitrate, nitrogen. Uh, thumb rule is that about each ton of straw will immobilize about 30 pounds of nitrogen. That's not a permanent loss, that's a temporary loss, but that's a loss that would be hidden from the soil test and maybe hidden from early season crop growth next year. Uh, so without that immobilization, uh, going on, there might be a bit more nitrate in remaining. The other thing is that there was a lot of straw removed. Uh, and so if it was physically removed from the field, again, there's less there that may take take a part in immobilization. 
And certainly I'll mention more uh, later about the impact on the, the phosphate and potash levels. What about the, this high residual N? Well, uh, you know, let's not look a gift horse in the mouth. I, I, I hear um, people uh, uh, bemoaning this for a couple of reasons we'll talk about. But, you know, with, with, with some of the current fertilizer prices that uh, we may be dealing with, uh, there are some real substantial savings to, to be done this fall by having some uh, well done and uh, uh, yeah, uh, soil, soil sampling of your fields uh, to uh, do an inventory and see how much nitrogen you might needing, need to apply or whether you even need to do a fall application. People may be deciding that they can get away with spring uh, applications to the crop. Where, where, where uh, I've, I've heard uh, people looking at the downside is, is this going to challenge our soybeans or maybe peas too much? If we turn the clock back 15, 20 years when we saw the, uh, well, the invasion of soybeans in the province, we dealt with wrecks. Uh, nodulation seemed to be sometimes hard to get, good, good nodulation. And sometimes that was an artifact of high soil nitrate. Uh, so we developed a thumb rule, not on a lot of research, but on observations that if we had high levels of nitrate, not really high, 60, 70 pounds nitrate end per acre, that probably not put your first crop of soybeans there. Uh, we took heat at the time. Uh, there were agronomists uh, east of the river that were telling me that we've got no problems with high nitrate with our soybeans. Uh, we don't need your thumb rule. And so we've we evaluated this. Uh, again, not no one does research studies on, on, on what goes wrong things. Uh, your associations don't fund these things. Uh, some of us just go out and do some guerrilla projects where we do things. So John Lee and Ron Tone and myself did some studies where we put out nitrogen in the spring. And we found that when we had virgin soybeans, that yes, uh, 50 to 100 pounds of nitrogen uh, really uh, uh, marred or, or detracted uh, nodulation. But when we'd had a history of soybeans there, that thumb rule really didn't apply that much. And it's obvious that you're able to tolerate more uh, uh, of this nitrate uh, in the soil if we've had a history of soybeans. And most of Manitoba, that's the reality now. And I'll cover more of that later. Uh, but the other factor you need to account, and we demonstrated, found this in our little uh, Bush League studies, was that we could trigger iron deficiency chlorosis. High levels of nitrate in the soil are a risk factor just like salts or calcium carbonate equivalent or free lime is. They can contribute to uh, IDC. So for that, I would suggest you do your variety selection of tolerant varieties. Uh, does high nitrate affect other crops? Well, we do need to respect the, the amount that's there. And uh, for example, if you're a malt barley producer, uh, it may be tough to produce some low protein uh, acceptable malt if that's the case and we didn't see much cereal lodging this year because of lack of moisture but if we're putting cereals in if we do get moisture and we have these amounts of levels we're certainly looking at uh, rates that may cause lodging next year ah something that uh, is rearing its head now i've just taken some some pictures out here here's just a, a look at how uh, i call this cereal regrowth or volunteer is uh, uh, looking like in my backyard, uh, parts of the Red River Valley. Some of these did not yield very good crops this year, but there was some really good regrowth or, or volunteer, good if you look at it that way. And many of our farmers have been judiciously out there uh, knocking it off, just deciding enough is enough, no more water and no more nutrients am I gonna let be taken up, or it may just be part of their, their fall weed control program. Uh, other interesting thing with canola, often on some of these really low or unharvested fields, it's regrowth. So these are not coming back from seed. I don't know if you can see it in the picture here, but this is actually coming off a, 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 of a, an old stem that had kind of shut down and now come back to life. And so here's some streaky patterns in fields, but uh, we can see that there is uh, quite a bit of vegetation there. I'll get to later what some of that May, may be affecting as far as nutrients. 
because are these benefits or detriments? Uh, my thinking on this is in wet environments, these are a bonus because under wet environments, then we lose nitrate to leaching or denitrification. And uh, in some studies uh, done by you know, AgVis and, and uh, actually right here at the University of Manitoba, some research uh, shows that cover crops uh, that are grown uh, can take up or not take up, but reduce the soil nitrate in by up to 50 to 60 pounds per acre when you've got rank growth getting up to about the boot stage or uh, full rosette stage of uh, cereals or oilseed radish. The dilemma is that the amounting body of research stateside and observed here at the, the, the U of M study is that we don't get all that nitrogen back. Uh, and in fact, that nitrate in, uh, it, it can, can, the lack of it can short the following crop. We may need more nitrogen. And so uh, maybe that could be managed through, uh, maybe that can be managed through uh, earlier termination or something like that but it is a risk. So, uh, but under, under environments when it's dry, I would call it dry, uh, these, uh, whether they be volunteer regrowth or cover crops, they're consuming water that Marla told us Monday, well, we need something between six and 10 inches to recharge our soils. I don't want to uh, spare that for something else growing right now. We, we need that banked in the soil. So that's kind of been our message along here that uh, be prepared to terminate before we're going to lose too much uh, nitrogen and water. Uh, if I want to know how much nitrogen is being taken up, here's a way to take uh, you know, some of what we know about nitrogen uptake patterns. And if we look here at the crops of uh, canola and wheat, we can see that their uptake really takes place really early compared to our other crops. Uh, between tillering and stem elongation, three to five weeks after seeding or germinating or regrowing, uh, this is the amounts that can be taken up. You know, for cereals, it looks it could be anywhere between 25 and 80 pounds of nitrogen per acre. With canola, uh, getting up to the rosette, early rosette stage, 15 to 70 pounds. So there could be quite a bit of nitrogen out there using a back of the envelope calculation here. Um, before we do the case study, I want to flick over to phosphorus. Um, uh, farmers applied phosphorus in the spring, and little, uh, little of that phosphorus may have been removed due to uh, a drought and lower yields. But I expect there have been pretty minor impact on the STP, or what I call soil test phosphorus. And that's because in our, our prairie soils, it takes anywhere between 16 to 40 pounds of phosphate in excess of the removal amount to increase by one part per million. So if those are the type of rates that were applied um, and not much of a crop removed, at most we'd be looking at an increase of one to two to three parts per million. And that really is not enough to shift us from you know, a, a, a low into a medium into a high range. So I'm still thinking we are, well, we're definitely still going to need starter phosphorus for 2022. The rates you need are going to be dependent on your reserves. Um, but I want to suggest that if, if growers, if your growers have been working to build their phosphorus into a medium high level, that's where we consider balance inputs or meeting removals. Um, you know, some of the past research and we've asked Cindy Grant to cover this at the, the MAC conference in December uh, about let's let, show us this data that does this. But historically, you know, 15 to 20 pounds of phosphate uh, placed close to seed can still give very good yield response when we've got a decent base rate in the soil. Uh, we have to do remember that that's at the expense of long-term reserves. That's applying less than we expect to be removed. So we need to be back at it again. But uh, there may be some uh, wiggle room accorded to those farmers that uh, have been uh, working to get their soil test levels into what we consider a, a good working range. So potassium, 
we might actually expect to see uh, some of our potassium levels slightly less than normal. Uh, there's a tendency that under dry conditions uh, that more potassium is fixed. And that fixing is what's fixed between the layers of, of clay. Uh, the drier it gets, uh, uh, the, uh, those clay sheets tend to trap shut. And so the potassium, not just on the surfaces or on the exchange complex, but trapped between. And so that may mean that we have a bit less for crop uptake and less is measured in the soil test. But this is a rather temporary phenomenon. And we expect that once soils re-wet, and some of them have re-wetted this fall, we expect that to return to near normal. The other thing we do need to consider, though, is that we could have had some major drawdown on total potassium, depending on how crops were harvested. If some were salvaged as green feed or straw, there could be some major removals on our soils. An example of that, uh, potassium levels in the green feed, if if we look at some of this is uh, some of our recent data on uptake and removals uh, for wheat and oats uh, per bushel produced uh, for, 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 for wheat and oats, it's somewhere about 0.2 pounds of K2O per bushel that's produced is removed. But when we take that crop off as green feed, we're taking off uh, uh, you know, upwards of uh, five to six times as much potassium. If you're on a soil that doesn't have a lot of reserves, if you're on sandy or loam soils, uh, this could certainly be affecting your soil test levels. You may need to may to, need to get some manure back from that uh, cattle guy that got your straw. So a few, uh, just a few case studies here. One is about how dry was it this year? We don't normally see this going on, but I had uh, a, a farmer point this out to me, and so we did some investigation. You can see though volunteer canola growing over the spring mid-row band. I'd been asked about this earlier. You know, why are we getting high nitrate levels? Are we still hitting nitrogen bands from the spring? And I said, no, that doesn't happen. Uh, we those those bands still aren't there. But uh, and what's well, it's nice to eat humble pie. And so here we're seeing that yes, indeed, there is some residual. Uh, when we sampled that. Yeah, there's there's not a lot, but there's three times more nitrogen in those green strips where that mineral band was than in the area between. You can see there was also some phosphorus and some sulfur in that band, and some of that may still be showing up as an artifact. Uh, is this going to be a big problem with soil sampling? Generally, we think no, but uh, if if it is. Uh, there are strategies for this. One is to take paired sampling. Uh, you would take a sample here, and then you would take a paired sample. If there's 20 inch mid row bands, you take samples in the field 10 inches apart and pair them. And then that would uh, tend to make sure that you're not distorting your values with a hot spot. Uh, and, there, and there's also strategies for phosphorus too, if we have long term phosphorus bands. But not expecting to see this as a big dilemma, but uh, because we're seeing it, we maybe need to address it. Uh, and agronomists turn this in that it is so dry when we're digging, we're still seeing we're still seeing gran granular pellets of fertilizer there. When I look at it here up close, I say, well, that's a that's a ESN shell. Uh, they always stick around; they don't decompose. So you can still see those and. That one looks pretty shriveled up. So hopefully all the, the urea uh, leaked out of it. This here, this is probably a, a, a map granule and it's uh, broken down, not completely dissolved, but I imagine most of the soluble phosphorus has dissipated, removed, diffused out of that. And so it isn't that it is in its original form, but uh, interesting that uh, when we're poking around, we're still finding these artifacts. And, you know, sometimes you just got to answer questions. So, Dane, how many nutrients really are in all that volunteer regrowth of canola out there? And uh, it was a lot more than I thought. Uh, we were to a field in the, the heart of the drought, the Brunkild area. And this is, uh, 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 <clears throat> you know, the, the plant of the Frankenstein. It wasn't worth harvesting, but then with some rains, kind of came back to life. 
and the biomass out there in the average area, a ton and 1.9 ton per acre, over two and a half tons in a ranker area. And the nutrient concentration in this foliage uh, was quite high. Probably a bunch of that was a nitrate carryover, and so it was readily taken up. There's a lot of nutrients in this growth. There's 160 pounds of nitrogen, 30 of phosphate, quite a bit of potassium. If I just look at the nitrogen phosphate cost, uh, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of dollars worth of nitrogen and phosphorus in some of that top growth already. If I'm just gonna leave that there, uh, I will get access to that later anyways. If I'm harvesting and taking it away, maybe need a factor in a, a reduction. Uh, and again, even though that's there, remember, we really don't know how to account if for cover crop or uh, a volunteer nutrients. We know that full amount isn't available next year. It still needs to break down and decompose. Same thing looking at some volunteer that we went into. Uh, some of these regrowth fields are looking better than the original crop this year. In this case, it's about a ton per acre. And when we look at the uptake, there's about 80 pounds of nitrogen, 85 of uh, potash in something there, not, not even quite at the boot stage yet. And again, some high dollar value of, of nutrients uh, in that crop. So soil nitrates, are they gonna change? Well, they may change if we get very wet, we could get see the traditional losses again. We know already that some is being hidden either in the volunteer or cover crop. Is there mineralization taking this fall? Uh, a lot of our soils here are still, they've dried right up again, so there's not a lot going on. Last year, I soil sampled pea fields every couple of weeks, and, I, and we measured no mineralization from that pea residue throughout the fall. It was just too dry. So it may even be dry for mineralization occurring yet this fall. What I'm suggesting to agronomists uh, for your, your clients, maybe you pick one of their sus strange fields with high numbers, benchmark an area, throw a flag down there, sample now or, or with your earlier test, sample again at freeze up, sample in the spring, just track what, what has happened. If you're seeing a lot of changes taking place, uh, you'll still have time to work with that grower on, uh, on some nitrogen, uh, uh, plan B's. Okay, we covered the birch effect, uh, and that's a short-term burst of nitrate in, uh, released from the desiccated microbes upon rewetting. That level generally tends to return uh, back closer to normal once that nitrate in is, is re-immobilized by microbes again. But again, something that may be a, a short-term artifact Paying off, this is something we look to our Australians deal with this sometimes. It's a phenomena when well to highly fertilized cereals with nitrogen grow very aggressively with scarce soil water through the vegetative stage, but they use up a lot of that soil water, leaving little for grain fill. And an observation they often see down there uh, that they get lower yields from these highly fertilized fields than where it's modestly fertilized and leave some water remaining for uh, grain filling. So uh, again, something, uh, it'll be up to you and your growers fields to assess whether this might have been happening in their situations. Nitrate toxicity, uh, certainly something that's uh, top of mind for livestock growers because under stress conditions, drought or it could be frost or hail or other things. Uh, cereals may take up nitrate end from the soil, but if phos photosynthesis is impaired, it does not move that nitrogen nitrate along to ammonium and into protein. And this nitrate can accumulate, often accumulating in the lower stem. And this can be at, at amounts uh, toxic to livestock. Uh, and again, it comes out from number of stresses. I'm glad to see growers in this area are looking at all this regrowth out there, but a lot of them are taking nitrate tests and finding that some of them are uh, probably best left in the field, not fed to livestock. 
Last one is the solar corridor. This is, is a bit of a unique phenomena uh, that uh, some guys in the really dry part of Nebraska found out several years ago, a drought-related area without irrigation. They found that if they simply grew their corn or other crops in 60-inch rows, like really wide rows, uh, they not only that they found that they captured solar radiation that improved growth, but they have a greater volume of stored soil moisture uh, because you've got these wide rows. The only trick is making sure that you control all your reeds in the rows so that they don't use the water. So uh, there's a little bit of a, a, a movement uh, that talks about this. I don't know how relevant it would ever be here, but uh, again, just some trivia. Again, another strategy that uh, uh, may get some uh, Google or tw Twitter action. Uh, just a note, in fertilizing for next year, I would steer you, why not use our 15-year-old uh, uh, decision tool? Because if you're wondering about how stored soil moisture affects it, you could use some of our moisture-based guidelines for wheat and barley, uh, uh, either the arid, dry, or moist. And the other thing, with expensive nitrogen and phosphorus, you can use the economic part of this calculator to determine where is an economically optimum target. Uh, fall fertilization pointers. It may be October, but still feels like August today. Hot days, warm soils. Uh, if you're applying nitrogen now or earlier, uh, we could see a ammonium convert quite rapidly to nitrate form, leaving it to losses if we get wet conditions. So uh, I'm a proponent now uh, with these high soil temperatures, that's kind of telling you that it's important to use an nitrification inhibitor. Those would be like an Enserve or a Centuro for ammonia. And we actually had tests this past year and showed that those products do exactly what they're supposed to do. They keep more of that nitrogen in the ammonium form versus the nitrate. And with both those products, we had more and left in the spring than where we had ammonia alone. You could go to a website that, you know, I guess look at these temperatures. The, these temperatures still during the day up to 15 degrees. So this, this is not nitrogen application conditions. Maybe it'll cool down. Just a reminder that uh, when does early nitrogen application uh, punish us? When are we punished? We're punished when we do that on poorly drained soils or soils that get wet. In those cases, early, early nitrogen application produces lower yields. If we're on well drained and we don't get excessive water, we will dodge, we may well dodge that bullet and we can still get good yields. But unless you've got a crystal ball, uh, uh, the, the, the shrewder uh, uh, managed thing to do is to manage that nitrogen, either, either wait till it's colder, soils have cooled, or use an inhibitor early. And good luck with doing that. I, I thought our soils had wet up enough that it wasn't going to be a problem, but we know the last uh, year, it, it actually was too dry to apply ammonia, not because there was a lack of moisture to chemically hold the ammonia, but it is just tough to seal bands in the soil when you're working up clods. And options are to apply deeper, uh, that just makes bigger clods. People told me uh, possibly if people have done pre-tillage of the soil, that soil will be more friable and will uh, close in the trench. We can wait for moisture. Uh, 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 some farmers actually have put some closing devices, uh, things on their shanks to try to keep that closed. Uh, or you just wait for conditions to improve. But anyways, uh, that's about it. And one more thing, Marla, here is, this is a dry weather use of ammonia that I need to promote here. And that is that, because you won't learn this in school, you generation of new agronomists, you don't even know about this stuff. This is stuff from the eighties. And, but we have a reawakening of it. And uh, that is we, when we end up feeding straw and poor roughages by ammoniating them, we can substantially increase protein and digestibility uh, with applications of ammonia. 
I think the target we're putting on is about 3% uh, 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 nitrogen uh, per weight of, of, of straw. We've had one field demonstration already this year, and this one is coming up next week, uh, uh, just west of the river. My mouse ain't working that good right now, but uh, uh, nevertheless, we're gonna be ammoniating some corn stalks there. And so if you have beef farmers in your service area, you wanna do them a service, produce some better quality feed, uh, you may wanna send them or attend this workshop and see how it's done because you can't read this on the internet. They don't teach this at school. This is the kind of thing you, you learn from old timers. And we've got some old timers on staff that know how to do this. Okay, I'm done, Marla. Awesome, thank you, John. Um, so, uh, so I posted to the chat just a reminder about CCA credits, uh, so you guys can read that there. Um, first question, since you were wrapping up on the idea of feeding, um, uh, like for livestock anyway and grazing, there's a question that is talking about grazing regrowth. Um, so if you are dealing with regrowth situations and you are grazing them, what is expected as exported, exported nutrients from that field through the grazing? Ah, good, 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 good question. Uh, and that, that's why our, um, our, our pasture systems uh, uh, really do, do, do not tend to export that much. Uh, but it depends where the watering hole is. Uh, cattle do tend to move, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I don't know. I've got instructions going over my computer here, distracting oh. me. Anyways. Uh, uh, but yeah, the, the, those cattle, if they're taking those nutrients anywhere, it'll be between where they eat and the water hole. And we've always found it's better to have the water holes out in the fields. So then they keep those nutrients in the field, but there actually ends up being precious little nutrients lost uh, uh, from that field when they're grazing it. But I, I would caution, uh, don't assume that those forages are all nitrate free. Uh, you should still be taking clippings. Uh, we know in this Carmen area, there are people that have refused to graze or harvest what look like pretty lush crops uh, because they've done the testing. And I apologize for the things clicking on your computer, John. I was just stopping sharing your screen on your behalf, um, but your webcam's on, so you, off, so you probably click on that and turn it back on again. Okay. Uh, so, uh there now i can see your lovely face again all right um okay so nitrogen uh dealing with things like nitrogen so there's a question came in and this is an interesting one in terms of some of the frustrations and issues that come along with soil sampling at this time of year when it is very dry so the question is is there any chance that high nitrogen like residual n um could be from the dry powdery soil so that when sampling the top powder is running down the probe into the lower profile and causing results to be a bit higher because of tough sampling conditions. So essentially that would be more that the higher nitrogen in the zero to six might be contaminating the six to 24 inch depth if it's falling down the probe. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's a good, good comment. And I'll maybe make something else about hints for sampling in dry conditions, but mm -hmm. That really is why uh, it's preferable at all possible. Do the sampling before any tillage is done. Uh, if we're going into untilled soil, then we, we have much better integrity of keeping those uh, samples separated. Uh, but it, it, it's interesting, you know, in this part of the world, we had chasms open up in our clay soils. And if there was any tillage done, uh, you know, we, we had a whole bunch of topsoil move into those two foot cracks. And, uh, you know, when we do our soils tours, we find these uh, 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 black streaks in the soil where topsoil has been integrated over the past. Uh, I doubt if that's a big factor here, uh, but I, I do think that may be a challenge if people are sampling on soils that have been tilled. Uh, and the, the, the trick on that is to uh, uh, 
uh, wiggle the, the sampler so you sample in, a, in your wheel track, so you firmed up or compacted that soil a bit. Uh, initially, we thought it might be so dry that samples may fall out the bottom of the tube. And I'm told that savvy agronomists know that what you do, you put that tube in, you lift it a fraction, and then you jam it down again. And that tends to put a little plug at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're having issues with that, uh, talk to your soil test company uh, or providers, because there's a few tricks of the trade that they can help you with. Yeah, it's good to know, because I've heard of other people having issues, especially in sandier soils. Um, some of the dry, sandier soils uh, that they just haven't been holding together and having problems pulling those um, pulling those samples out of the ground without losing the soil in them. Uh, okay, um, so speaking then about the residual nitrogen then that we are seeing, could there be significant loss potential for residual N over the winter and spring? Um, yes, yeah, yeah. I, I, maybe I should say, I hope so. I hope we get, because you, uh, you tell me if I'm wrong, we need between six and 10 inches of rainfall to prime our soils to fill the bank for good yield potential in 2022. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm hoping we're gonna get that recharge. And, but with that recharge does come the risk of losses. Uh, and uh, the losses on well-drained soils may be, be, sorry, may be due to some leaching, some movement uh, with depth. Uh, and on, on heavier soils, uh, if there's standing or ponded water, it, there may be uh, some saturation, maybe denitrification. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a risk we, we always take when we put fertilizer down in the fall. Uh, and that same loss can occur with uh, nitrate nitrogen that we're measuring right now. So uh, like I said, yes, that loss might happen. And yeah, I, I am willing to give up a bit of nitrogen loss uh, for yield potential. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so thinking about yield potential across these varying landscapes that we have, and this is bringing in things that Curtis has talked about with in terms of landscape restoration and just erosion on landscapes, thinking about the potential that we have across these variable, some of these variable landscapes. Um, in dry conditions like right now, where we're seeing potential I don't know if the, it's it's a it's a wider range of potential yield robbers than we would if we were say in a wet year or wet years. Um, what is the advantage now compared to other years of adopting things like variable rate technology for fertilizer application or for targeting different regions of the field? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. Uh, uh, and, and I certainly know there's going to be variability uh, out there. I think a lot of the agronomists that, I, uh, to be honest, no, no one has shared with me yet any uh, variable rate uh, or zone managed results. They're just sharing with me that, boy, some of the numbers are very high. So I don't know how it's affecting zone managed uh, nutrients uh, like nitrogen. Uh, but you know, one thing that is interesting, uh, these this volunteer regrowth and stuff like that, or even when you get cover crops to grow, there ain't nothing uniform about it usually. It's usually variable. There's going to be more in the swaths than other areas. And so they all, they all may impart some level of variability out there. Uh, I, I should note, though, uh, the, the return of nitrogen from uh, 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 cover crops or uh, this regrowth is so unpredictable that you know soil test labs, most of them are not offering any credit for it. Mm -hmm. They're just saying it, 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 it's, it's a crop shoot, so we're not going to give you a credit. If there's anything there, it'll be a bonus. The thing so, I Curtis, could add if, uh, on that too, just when you were talking about variable rate or precision ag too, is a, a general rule of thumb uh, looking at your high spots versus low spots, um, generally your high spots are like 50% of the yield potential. Could be yeah. worse a dry year. 
Exactly. It's made even even worse in the conditions that we're in right now. Yeah. Uh, uh, Marla, something I, I wanted to mention, not really variable rate, but but could be. Uh, our, our, our friend Guy Lafond, uh, based in Indian Head years ago, he kind of tackled this fertilizing nitrogen under drought conditions with uh, a, a split nitrogen approach. Start the crop with wheat and canola with 50, 60 percent of what you anticipate it'll need. And then if moisture conditions look good, then come back with the remainder. And uh, uh, he had that work in most cases. When I quizzed him on that, he said, don't bother in Manitoba. If you have fully charged soils, you put the full meal deal on up front. But, but we don't have fully charged soils. We may not have fully charged soils. And uh, I'm wondering if that type of a Saskatchewan approach may appeal to some people. I know some that tried it this past year uh, with split applications, started with the bulk of the nitrogen, planned to come back later, and some, when they saw how poor the crop was shaping up, just withheld that nitrogen. So um, interesting approach we don't normally resort to here, but uh, maybe we have to borrow some strategies off the shelf. Yeah, that's a good point too. And I'm curious as well to see if we're going to have more, more people kind of holding off on putting that full, full fertilization down uh, in the spring because of the question of what next year is going to look like too. Um, uh, okay, so somebody posted a question here, having a few fields from fall soil sampling that are coming back with very low residual nitrate in the top two feet, even though in this example, the canola crop yielded 17 when they were targeting 50 and they fertilized for 50 bushel crop with urea at time of seeding. Is there any idea why there's low yield and also not a whole lot remaining in terms of the residual N. Said virtually no moisture has been received throughout the growing season up to this point. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think they're talking about the example that I showed that picture. Uh, I showed the picture of those mid-row bands showing up in the canola volunteer there. Uh, that That's a field that only yielded 20 bushel the acre and, mm -hmm. and those nitrate levels are are rather low. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure where, where that uh, uh, nitrogen has gone. The, the best, you know, the nitrogen cycle, there's so many different factors in play, it, it could sometimes give us a way out. Uh, uh, in my case, it was a sandy soil. We did get one three inch gusher there in the, in the season, the fairly short lived, a lot ran off, but that may have impacted something. But uh, I don't know, uh, but there will be people that question the nitrate test. And we've done work in the past and had non-believers disregard it, fertilize with a full rate of nitrogen and have the following crop go flat as pee in a plate. So it, it, the test does work. It does measure nitrate, nitrogen. It's just that that's the amount that's there the day that you take it. And it, there may be conditions that uh, change or modify it after. So um, we've we've had this kind of like the great debate to some degree this week already about weeds, cover, regrowth, things that are continuing to use up moisture in the spring that we don't want using up moisture, or, sorry, in the fall, that we don't want using up moisture right now, but at the same time are providing cover and potentially erosion protection and things like that, that we also want to, to have for next year. If you're dealing with a high nitrate situation, high residual nitrate situation, is there any, and you don't want it say to be that high, is there any advantage to letting that regrowth happen, letting those weeds grow, whatever it is that's taking up that nitrogen and locking some of that up then in that plant material to slow that release into the future, as opposed to like, how is there a benefit to that compared to the potential moisture loss that comes from that cover growing right now? Uh, you know, if, if, if I was looking for an opportunity for that, may, maybe it's where, uh, where you're fretting about a place to put your soybeans. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, the, the nitrate levels that would tend to impair nodulation are those in the surface soil. The, the ones at depth, 
they really aren't the ones that are going to impair the uh, nodule formation. And so if we have uh, uh, some crops growing with scarce moisture, and they're gonna be pulling nitrogen probably from that surface. Uh, you know, I had no idea how much nitrogen was gonna be pulled by these things until I measured it. And, mm -hmm. and ladies and gentlemen, this is not rocket science. You just take a pair of scissors to the field, you just clip what's a square meter, you dry it, and then you take a sample clipping beside it and just send to your local uh, soil test lab for a tissue analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and and so, yeah, it's not, not rocket science, but it gives you a number. The problem is uh, you'll have a number and you won't know what to do with the nitrogen levels. You just know that there's a lot up there and hopefully you get it back eventually. Is that then also uh, a reminder too that in these conditions and not knowing like, well, if it stays dry through the fall, great. But if we start getting moisture in the fall that can change nitrogen levels in the soil based on the reactivity of microbes and such that can happen. Are we, is that another reason to also encourage waiting a little longer if we can to do our soil sampling rather than rushing out to do it really early in the fall because things can be changing either with that plant upgrowth uptake or potential rain yet that could be moving things around a little bit? Uh, yes, of course, Marla. And uh, I, you knew this answer, but the, the problem is that uh, fall fertilization is a common practice in Manitoba and the, the sooner, so we often make compromises and a compromise on being able to make good decisions earlier in the season uh, uh, does mean that we're likely to sample earlier. Uh, if I wanted a, a, a sample, uh, and that's why I'm suggesting that uh, agronomists, you're not gonna resample all your fields, but you may wish to go to a few that you're curious, your growers curious on, and, and just do some benchmark sampling, not to gauge the whole field, but to gauge the temporal or over time change that takes place. Um, what I'd expect the change is, is if we get a ton of water, or if, if we have gone from no regrowth when you sampled to a lot now, uh, that that may certainly have impacted things. Uh, so uh, some of those may warrant this this other little bit of a homework assignment. Love that Professor John is giving us a homework assignment this morning. Um, let's talk quickly on the price of fertilizer. Uh, this question came in when you were talking about this idea of the ammoniating of straw bales right now for feed practices. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if you have this question, this answer um, in your back pocket. Uh, you may if you're getting ready to uh, for this field day next week, correct? Um, so if uh, nitrogen being, you know, 90 cents a pound, what's the cost of ammoniating straw bales right now? Oh, I, we know exactly what that answer is. Uh, it's just uh, I, I don't know. Uh, but uh, the the person that were, is working with us on that project is Ben Ham, uh, our farm production or uh, uh, farm management specialist out of that area. Uh, there is uh, uh, he goes through some detailed uh, comparisons of ammoniating versus uh, other treatments or things. And at present, even with the high cost, it is very attractive. Uh, and so I'd encourage you, if you can't come to the workshop, you can certainly contact Ben to get that financial analysis and uh, the how to it, you know, it, it's, like, it's like being Moby Dick. It's like harpooning a big white whale in the field with this big spear and then pumping it full of ammonia. So uh, it really is a sight to be seen, Marla. I, uh, I hope that some people uh, attend then from this because uh, I figure I, I want to go out now and be able to behold this site as well. Um, so I uh, just had one comment that had come in from one of the agronomists in the group saying logistically we have to start sampling early because we never know when the weather is going to turn on us and we never get it all done in time. And I absolutely agree with that because there's a lot of soil sampling to get done in the fall and we really have no idea what the weather is ever going to do. And if um, the comment was what yesterday if you know here we've got it was so windy 30 degree days 
and somebody had said to me if it was 30 degrees cooler with these winds it would be quite the blizzard that we're dealing with compared to what we saw a couple of years late a couple of years ago dealing with the blizzards and thanksgiving so we just never know um what's out there but i do think that john the idea that john has posed about you know benchmarking a few sites to be able to see that later on and see if that change is happening was kind of interesting yep. Uh, I, I, I want to agree and I, I want to applaud uh, our, our fleet of agronomists out there uh, that are set up to do soil sampling. Uh, we're the best prepared we've ever been uh, with uh, agronomists doing good sampling. Uh, the two foot sampling is uh, kind of the standard that we adhere to. And uh, we are probably getting better quality sampling now than we've ever had in Manitoba. So. Uh, and, and this is not a, a scolding uh, that uh, if, if people sampled earlier, it's just suggesting that if you're thinking things might have changed, it may warrant a peek at uh, what those changes might be. Absolutely. So I'm just typing into the chat here, um, a reminder about tomorrow um, to email me at marla.rickman as I type it in, at gov.mb.ca. Um, and so if, um, as we're kind of wrapping up here today, uh, this may be our last time together. We'll see what comes in to my email, my inbox today. Um, so if there are additional topics or things that we haven't covered this week regarding this dry condition, soil management, um, please send your ideas or questions to me by noon today. And if we have them by noon, then we'll make the call on whether or not we've got enough content to fill our hour tomorrow. Uh, and uh, if not, then that is fantastic. We've had a, a great four days. I really, truly appreciate a the time that our panelists have put to, like spent to put together to um, to organize this and to speak and be here every morning. And I also very much appreciate the attendance that you guys have brought forward, the questions you brought forward, the interaction with you um, through the question box has been fantastic. So uh, I hope that we've been able to address some kind of key concepts and ideas right now. We know that it's a dry it's been a dry year and it's been a struggle and it's a struggle going into next year too in terms of what we can expect when so much is still unknown so um again i think it's important that we have these times to discuss and gather and, and bring these ideas forward so unless there's any last comments from my panelists thank you you're, you're a great uh uh hostess marla Thanks, John. Um, and it's always a lot of fun being able to do this, We're working with the panelists that I got, because you guys are always fun to work with, too. So anyhow. Did you want to mention to our, our audience how many you had signed up to your, your fan club here? Yeah, the fan club. So our soil and water management fan club um, had a really fast sign up. We pulled this together kind of last minute, as you guys will know. Um, and uh, within, I think, an hour of the tweet going out, we already had 50 people signed up. We've had over 100 people sign up for, or sorry, 100, 200 people sign up for this webinar in a very short amount of time. And every day, if you guys can see, there's always been in around 100 or more um, here. And we're also getting lots of views on YouTube as well. So just as a reminder, too, if you missed one of our sessions, if you Google Manitoba Agriculture YouTube, you'll be able to go to the Manitoba Agriculture YouTube page. And on there, there is a soil and water uh, week um, playlist. And so you can click on and it will show you the four presentations so far um, and possibly a fifth, depending on what the decision is for tomorrow. So again, thank you everybody for your time and your interest in these topics. And we may see you tomorrow. And if we don't though, have a very safe and happy fall and uh, we will talk to you later. Bye everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah.